I'm going to talk about Shakespeare's play Measure for Measure today. And before I go directly into the details of Shakespeare's play, I'd like to step back a little bit from drama and talk about the genres of comedy and tragedy. The reason why is because Shakespeare is one of the most remarkable of literary artists in the sense that he is capable of producing both comedy and tragedy at a grand scale. He is capable of taking both of those genres of drama to their maximum potential. So the contrast between them may be of some use to us because the comedy we're going to look at today, Measure for Measure, is one of Shakespeare's great underrated achievements. Now the first thing we should consider is the fact that comedy and tragedy characters, characteristically end differently. Comedies end in marriage, tragedies end in death. If you think of things like the Greek tragedies, almost all of Greek tragic heroes have some fatal flaw, do something wrong, make a mess of their lives, and at the end of it they die. But before their death, a tragic hero always meets some realization about the human condition, finds out about their fatal flaw, and the consequence of that is that they realize something about the human condition. Tragedy is a very fatalistic sort of dramatic form. Comedy is different. Comedies characteristically end in marriage rather than death. And this difference or this juxtaposition between ending in death or ending in life, because marriage can be thought of as symbolic sex, but also it's connected with generation and reproduction. And what that means is that comedy is more closely connected in its conclusions with life and with continuity. Tragedy is about death and it's about finality. In addition to that, I would be inclined to say that tragedy is about individuals, whereas comedy is about types. Think of Shakespeare's great tragedies. Hamlet is not an example of a prince of Denmark. He is not an example of a man who thinks too much and acts too little. He is specifically Hamlet, prince of Denmark. King Lear is not merely a foolish old man that gave his daughters his kingdom. In fact, he is a specific man that did a specific thing. All of tragedy individuates, and tragedy is always about specific individual people. Comedy, on the hand, other hand, surprisingly enough, is not primarily about specific people. Pri primarily, comedy is about types. We can think of many examples. Um, the best could be taken from Moliere. Think about some of the titles of Moliere's great comedies. The Miser, not Joe the Miser, but rather the Miser, the general type of the Miser. The Misanthrope, not Bob the Misanthrope, but the misanthropic man. Even something like Moliere's play Don Juan falls into that category. Let me try and illustrate that by comparing, say, um, the way we think about comic and tragic heroes. Suppose we had a young man who was excessively attracted to women and slept around a lot. We might be tempted to say, he's a real Don Juan. The reason why is that Don Juan is not a specific person. Don Juan is the type of the promiscuous man. So although it may appear that Moliere is violating the rule, in fact, Don Juan is a type of a person. Let's juxtapose that same young man. Instead of sleeping around a lot, let's imagine that he's very jealous about the woman in his life. None of us would be tempted to say, he's a real Othello. Even though Othello himself was a man whose tragic flaw was his excessive jealousy. The point is, Othello is a specific person, and we are not inclined to make the analogy from Othello or Hamlet or King Lear to people in the world around us. On the other hand, comic heroes, heroes that are not quite as grand as the tragic strutting and roaring are much more like us and as a consequence of that they become indistinguishable types. They are kinds of people. This works for the comedies of Aristophanes as well. I'm going to try and make the argument today that it works for Shakespeare's comedies. In particular, I would say that it works for Shakespeare's greatest comedy, Measure for Measure. Measure for Measure, it was written in 1604, around the same time that Shakespeare was writing his great tragedies. This is within a few years on either side of Macbeth, Lear, Hamlet, Othello. It's strange to see the fact that Shakespeare is perhaps the preeminent literary switch hitter in the Western tradition. Shakespeare is capable of producing both superior comedies and superior tragedies on the fly without noticeable disjunction in the way he thinks about the world. Now I would like to take it a little bit further and make a, a more complicated argument. I would like to argue that tragedy is intrinsically a non-Christian art form. That tragedy is intrinsically pagan. Think about the way in which a tragedy characteristically ends. Uh, Greek tragedy is a good example. Choose something like Antigone. 
the end of the play, she dies. What she finds out is that she has had some terrible flaw and she has somehow been the cause of her own demise. The point of tragedy, both Greek tragedy and Shakespearean tragedy, is that this superior hero finds out something about themselves that they didn't know before and they also find out something about the human condition. And when they find this out about the human condition, that there is no recourse for human beings, that eventually we all die and even superior people cause their own destruction, we are left with a very fatalistic outlook on life. My argument then is that it's not accidental that tragedy is caught up with the ancient Greek tradition. It's not possible to write a tragedy from the Christian perspective because at the end of a Christian life, the person dies, but that's not all there is to the story. Inevitably for a Christian, there is God's judgment thereafter. And that utterly changes the meaning of a li the life for a Christian. So my argument then is that if you look over the history of literature, you will never find a tragedy, a true tragedy, written from the Christian perspective, because at the end of a tragedy, the tragic hero has to die unredeemed. The whole point of Christianity, or one of the major points, is the idea of redemption and judgment for individual sins. Now, on the other hand, in contrast to tragedy, comedy can be a Christian art form. And I want to argue, at least in the case of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, that this is the Christian dramatic form and that Shakespeare's Measure for Measure is the Christian comedy. I want to try and make the rather large argument that Shakespeare's Measure for Measure is the greatest comedy written in the Western tradition. Now, I'll make the argument in aesthetic terms. In other words, this is my feeling about it. You need not adopt my feelings. But I'll try and make a good argument First, that Shakespeare is hunting intellectual big game in Measure for Measure. He is actually trying to recapitulate the entire Bible in the form of a comedy, which is an amazing intellectual achievement, and also it marks an apogee of intellectual aspiration and ambition, even if he doesn't completely pull this off. The idea of reducing the entire uh, the entirety of the Bible, and more importantly, the entirety of the Christian view of history to one narrative taking the form, the allegorical form, of a comedy, if he were to pull that off, and if I were able to make that argument, I believe that we would be faced with the greatest of Shakespeare's comedies, and I think it would be proper to argue that Shakespeare's comic achievements are at least at the level of his tragic achievements. It is often the case that we pay more philosophical attention to tragedy. Uh, tragedy gets all the good ink spilled over it. We only have Aristotle's discussion of tragedy, not of comedy. Perhaps the history of comedy would have been different if we had. But I'd like to try and make the unusual argument that Shakespeare's Measure for Measure is the greatest Christian comedy and one of Shakespeare's greatest achievements. Now, I don't mean to say that Shakespeare himself was a Christian. I doubt that very much. The man that, that could write King Lear does not have any great hope of eternal salvation and eternal life. The man who writes such fine tragedies must have a heavy dose of the pagan in him. My feeling is, rather, that Shakespeare is the most extraordinary of intellectual switch hitters. He was able to produce both comedy and tragedy, and when he was producing this particular comedy in 1604, he decided that he would go and organize this work of art completely from the Christian perspective. Not because he was a devout Christian, like someone like St. Augustine, but rather because he was intellectually showing off. He wanted to show that he was the ultimate literary artist and that he could write the best possible play in any sort of genre. So I think that the intellectual ambitions of Measure for Measure do not reflect Shakespeare's Christian leanings. They actually reflect something much more like pagan vanity. I believe it was Plato at the end of the symposium that says that the same artist could write great tragedies and great comedies. Well, very few have lived up to that possibility. Shakespeare has decided that he shall. Now, measure for measure, the characters are of great importance in this, and I'll, move, I'll start with them before I go to the plot. There is, first of all, a series of minor characters that have no real symbolic importance. These are Elbow, Pompey, Froth, and Mistress Overdone, and they are the patrons of a brothel, and Mistress Overdone is the proprietor of a brothel, and these people offer us throughout the course of the play, at various critical moments, comic relief. And comic relief is very important in a comedy that means to encapsulate all of Christianity. In other words, it would fail in its comic purpose if it didn't have certain slapstick elements in it. You would lose the sense of it being a comedy. It would be far too serious. So Shakespeare, knowing how to balance these things, has written in in an, in an oblique way, comic relief that is not part of the essential structure symbolically of the play.
Now, the other characters are all symbolic, and I want to make the argument that the whole Christian view of history is here, and that every one of the main characters has a Christian symbol attached to it. The first is the Duke. Now, the Duke is the ruler of Vienna, the city in which this play is set, and the Duke, in the beginning of the play, leaves for no reason that's obvious to the people involved, and he delegates his authority to two people, Angelo and Aeschylus, and when he leaves, he returns later on at the end of the play and judges in disguise and removes his disguise and comes back to judge everyone who has been wicked during the course of the play. And that sounds specifically and suspiciously like the end of the world. Let's see how the Duke pans out in the course of this play. The two people that he leaves in charge, I want to call them the personifications of Greek wisdom. The two people he leaves in charge are named Aeschylus and Angelo. Aeschylus did not get his name accidentally. Aeschylus is a wise old man who understands human frailties and human flaws. He's constantly arguing for mercy given the fact that people cannot always meet the standard of the law. Aeschylus understands human frailty and the impossibility of creating a perfect political order. The other element in the Greek tradition that's re that, that gets this uh, authority from the absent duke is named Angelo, and the name itself gives away Angelo's predispositions. Angelo is the man who thinks that he can be perfect. Angelo represents the tradition of platonic perfectionism. Angelo thinks that since he has never been tempted by the various sins that he sees in other people, that he is immune to them. He believes that he's better than they are. He believes that he's capable of standing in for the duke, and he's going to try and stand in for the duke, but it will turn out that our would-be angel, our would-be perfect man, is incapable of perfection and sin, particularly the sin of lust, the sin which is connected with the fall of man at the beginning of the Bible, turns out to be his downfall, a sin that he had never experienced before. So in addition to the Duke, who's gone, and Aeschylus and Angelo, we have several other characters which will be relevant to our symbolic analysis. The first will be Lucio. Now you can guess who Lucio is from his name. He's Lucifer, he's the devil, he's the tempter, and he's a great patron of the whorehouse that has been recently pulled down, that, and he's involved in many of the scenes of comic relief. And in addition, not only is he a hellion, and not only is he a tempter, he is great at blaspheming. He is great at saying that he knows the Duke well, and he knows full well that the Duke likes to drink and likes to, uh, to chase women and has a great many moral vices. Angela, uh, Lucio is, in fact, the role of the devil in this play. He represents sin and he represents temptation. And we'll see how that pans out in the course of the play. Now, Another key figure in this play is Isabella. Isabella is a novice nun. She has not taken her final vows yet, but she is extremely pious, extremely devoted. She spends a great deal of time praying and fasting and involved in mortification of the flesh, and she is virgin. The key thing here is not virginity by itself, but rather virginity as a symbol of uncorrupted selfhood, of a lack of a sinful, uh, sinful nature, or at least not succumbing to the temptations of sin. She will maintain her chastity throughout the play. May I suggest that she may well represent the Christian church? In fact, Isabella is an attempt to talk about the relationship between church and state, and her interaction with Angelo, the man that would be perfect, will turn out to be most intriguing for our understanding of how the Christian will view history. Now, another key figure in this play, he has somewhat of a minor role, but he sets the ball rolling in terms of the plot, is named Claudio. Claudio is Isabella's brother, and Claudio has been caught in fornication. He has gotten his betrothed with child. And as a result of that, when the Duke leaves, because there had been a considerable amount of license in, in, uh, in Vienna, when the Duke leaves, Angelo passes judgment on Claudio. He says, Claudio, you must die for your sins. Now, what we get out of that is a situation of great tension. This is the first act of the play. The Duke has departed. Angelo and Aeschylus don't know what to do. Angelo, the man who would be perfect, who would be personally perfect, but also the man who would create a perfect political order. He is that drive towards platonic perfectionism. Angelo says, from now on, the law will be enforced without regard to 
pity, or mercy. We will create a perfect political order. Now that the Duke is gone and I have all the authority in Vienna, I am now going to enforce the law. We will have moral perfection. Angelo believes himself right in trying to enforce moral perfection because Angelo believes that he is without sin. We will find many biblical references throughout the course of this play, but those of you who know the, uh, the parable that's in the Synoptic Gospels uh, about the woman taken in adultery, where we, uh, Jesus invites the crowd who, that wants to stone her to, and says, let him who, has without, who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, Angelo would be up at front of the line ready to cast the first stone because he has not absorbed the Christian message. He believes that he is without sin and that gives him the right to judge other people. Consider just briefly the title, Measure for Measure. Those of you that know the Gospels, perhaps know Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Judge not that you may not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you yourself shall be judged, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Yes, indeed, this is a play about justice, and it's about mercy, and it's about the possibility of extending charity to all people because all human governments are made up of frail and fallible and sinful people who are themselves in need of charity and mercy along with justice. The measure you give will be the measure you get back. So we get the Duke departed. Lucio, uh, rather Angelo, has decided that he will be something superhuman, that he will deal out justice in God's stead and he will enforce the law perfectly. Lucio, in the second scene of the first act, he finds out that his friend, Claudio, who has been engaging in this fornication, is now being sent off to jail and is condemned. And he does what seems to be his only altruistic thing in the whole play, because Lucio is constantly unkind and constantly evil, constantly miserable. He says, well, I must go help my friend Claudio. And the way in which he decides to go help his friend Claudio is to go to the nunnery where his sister, Isabella, is awaiting to take her vows and persuade her to go and intercede with Angelo for the life of her brother. The point being that although this appears to be altruistic and this appears to be a kind-hearted thing, in fact, it is exactly the opposite. What Lucio has done here is set one saint or one would-be saint against another, one who really understands Christian morality and the other who is a Pharisee, a hypocrite, a would-be perfect individual. And whichever one falls and whichever one remains steadfast, he can't help but win. So in fact, Lucio, the tempter, is setting one image of virtue against another image of virtue, knowing that they both cannot stand. In fact, it is a carefully and diabolically crafted scene. Isabella, the pure, virginal, chaste, and moral nun, goes to Angelo, and the scene is remarkable. In the wings, we have Lucio the tempter, and Isabella doesn't know what to say. She's not used to dealing with politicians, and at the sides, as she delivers her speech, asking for mercy for her brother, she is inclined to hold back because she knows that there is a certain degree of justice in it. She believes fornication to be an evil. She thinks that her brother merits punishment. She feels that the punishment is excessive. She is pleading for mercy. Her pleas for mercy go unanswered, but they gradually begin to melt Angelo. Angelo begins to melt like an ice cube, but from the inside out, he melts in the soul first. For the first time in his life, Angelo feels lust. Angelo begins to se feel sexual desire, and Angelo, the man who would be perfect, starts to become corrupt. There is a saying that, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, when the Duke leaves. He leaves under very mysterious circumstances. We don't quite know why he would do that. It turns out that he wishes to test Angelo because he knows that of all the men in his kingdom, Angelo is the one of the highest moral character. And if it turns out that Angelo is incapable of bearing the responsibility of political power, that means that there is no human being that can dispense God's justice. And if that's the case, then the idea of perfecting society, ignoring the tragic insight that human beings are essentially flawed and incapable of perfection, this play is an elaborate Christian criticism of that stance. Consider how the play develops. 
When we get to the scene with Angelo and Isabella and Lucio in the wings, telling her a little bit harder, a little bit further, come on, persuade him, you want your brother's life. He keeps on egging her on, and the more he eggs her on, the more persuasive her arguments become, and the more persuasive her arguments become, the more Angelo begins to melt. It's a remarkable psychological play, because when she leaves, he is totally unnerved. He said, oh no, for the first time, I have encountered lust, and I don't know what to do. And he says in particular, Oh, cunning devil, who, uh, who to catch a saint baits his hook with a saint. Oh yes, the snares of Satan are very carefully laid in this play. And once you begin to realize that it's to be understood at the allegorical, symbolical level, it all begins to fall together. Well, the Duca is waiting in the wings while Angelo does these deeds, while he is involved in... Di dispensing justice, a very harsh justice to, uh, to Claudio. And while Isabella is talking to him, Angelo says, look, away maid, come, in back, come back and talk to me tomorrow. I cannot talk to you today. Obviously he is losing his grip. We cut away and we see this in the next scene, third scene, the Duke is back, but he's back in disguise. Yes, the Duke has come as returned to Vienna, but he hasn't come in pomp and circumstance looking like a political leader. He has come back disguised as a friar, disguised as a holy man. The friar will overhear all the things that the Duke is not meant to overhear throughout the play. This theme of overhearing when people think they're alone is in fact a gesture at God's omnipotence and omniscience. God knows all, even the secrets that we believe we are keeping from the public. It turns out that the friar spends a great deal of his time overhearing secret plans and making sure that they do not result in immoral consequences, making sure that everyone maintains the, their position on the straight and narrow. Well, Angelo doesn't know that the friar is the duke and doesn't know that the duke has come back to see what manner of men the that and uh, what manner of man that angelo is and when isabella comes back on the second day to angelo he directly confronts her he says look i tell you what i will pardon your brother but i will only pardon him if you have sex with me you must give up your virginity, and you must give up your possibility of being saved. Remember, this is a mortal sin. She will be damned for all time as a consequence of this. On the other hand, her brother will be allowed to live. And there is a certain irony involved in the fact that he is being prosecuted for fornication, and Angelo, the, the would-be perfect man, is now suggesting sexual blackmail. It turns out that not only is he a Pharisee and a hypocrite, but he is worse than the man that he would condemn. What does Isabella do? Well, at first, she just doesn't understand the proposition. I mean, she is so chaste and so religious and devout that she is unable to comprehend the idea of a sex-for-mercy swamp. And, in fact, she produces some of the greatest poetry Shakespeare ever constructed, and much of this poetry is about the virtues of mercy and charity and justice. In particular, she says, I would to heaven that I had your potency, and you were Isabel. Should it, should it then be thus? No, I would, no, I would tell what to her, to, to be a judge and what to be a prisoner. The argument that she's making there is the golden rule. If I were the judge and you came pleading to me for clemency, I would give it to you, but here you deny it to me and insist on sexual blackmail. You would corrupt me and you would corrupt yourself and you would corrupt politics far worse than it was before. The attempt to create a perfect political order or to create a perfect individual human being is bound to result in a worse condition morally. So the futility of platonic perfectionism is played up here, and the idea that the man who would be perfect is in fact a whitened sepulcher, is in fact a hypocrite, is in fact worse than the people he judges, is all built into this very powerful, very ironic scene. Now, while, the, uh, while this argument is going on between Isabella and Angelo, Angelo is becoming progressively more evil. When she refuses to have sex with him, and refuses vehemently, she says, I, he says, I will torture your brother to death. And she says, no, absolutely not. I will not give up the possibility of eternal life, regardless of what you do here and now to my brother. A, my brother deserves punishment because he sinned, but B, it is a far greater thing for me to give up eternal life and salvation than for him to give up this small period of space and time that we are allotted. At this point, we are at an impasse. We are at a moral, at a condition of incredible moral tension. 
as Angelo, the man who would be perfect, seems as though he is going to win the day. But it turns out that the friar, who is in fact the duke in disguise, is back. And he has heard a colloquy between, uh, between Isabella and her brother Claudio in the jail. Isabella goes to see her brother Claudio and says, Claudio, I'm sorry you have to die. And the reason why you have to die is that the Duke propositioned me, and of course I said no. Now initially, Claudio is very brave about it and says, well, that's okay, I understand, you wouldn't want to lose your soul. But very shortly, very quickly, he says, look, have sex with him and save my life. Please don't do this to me. And she turns out to be a virago. She makes Lady Macbeth look soft. She laces into him with an absolute fury that you would not expect from a novice nun. But the idea is that he has not only sinned in the flesh, but he's intended to cause her damnation as well. And she said, oh, weak, inferior man, that you would do such a thing. So she refuses. Now, this conversation is overheard by the friar, and the key thing that happens is the friar says, don't worry, I'm going to take care of everything. She says to Isabella, the friar says to Isabella, or not, not to Isabella, but rather first to, uh, to Juliet, the woman that uh, Claudio got with child, do you repent your sins? And she says, yes. And she says, do you really repent them or do you repent the consequences? She says, I repent the sins truly and in a heartfelt way. He says, in that case, your sins are forgiven. From the woman with child, he goes to the Claudio who has been condemned. And he says to, you, to Claudio, Claudio, prepare for your death. You have sinned and you deserve it. Do not expect clemency. In fact, I know Angelo's heart. Angelo was just testing your sister, and he was happy to see that your sister was chaste and virtuous. But I have a way in which we can make this all work. He conspires with Isabella, the chaste and virtuous novice, to play a trick on Angelo. Angelo earlier in his life, it turns out, the Duke knows all. It'll turn out the Duke is omniscient, which is a very handy thing if you're Yahweh. Well, it turns out that the Duke knows that secretly, prior to his elevation to this great status, Angelo had been betrothed, and for no good reason, for an in, uh, insufficient reason, had broken off the betrothal. The woman still loves him. Now, obviously, this is not meant to be a realistic representation of human sexual desire, because the woman still likes Angelo, even though he's treated her abominably. And the Duke knows where to find this woman. Her name is Mariana. And the Duke says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch beds. Remember that all of Shakespearean comedy has to do with the mistaking of appearance for reality. So what they do is they make sure that there will be an assignation. And Angelo believes that this assignation will be between him and Isabella, that he will get what he wants. But in fact, the Duke has this well planned out. He has complete, things completely in hand. He makes sure that the assignation happens in the dark rather than in the light. And he makes sure that it happens in silence without any speech to give away her voice. These themes of light and darkness and silence and the word help tip you off to the biblical symbolism here. In fact, we're going to see the sin of Angelo completed, or he thinks completed. We must remember that Angelo believes that he has sinned. He has sinned in his heart, in his intent. The fact that he fails to actually carry that sin out from the Christian perspective makes no difference. He's a sinner because he intended to, and he will be judged on the basis of that intention. Well. What happens is, at the end of this assignation, they separate, and he thinks that he's done it. In fact, he has had sex with a woman to whom he was betrothed. And then it turns out that the bed trick goes awry. And here's where it turns out that Isabella's idealism was not at all misplaced. Angelo, because one sin leads to another, there's no such thing as sin in the singular, realizes that he is now an utterly Machiavellian individual. Suppose he lets Claudio go, and suppose he knows that he has bought his life at the cost of his si sister's salvation, and that he is damned and she is damned as a consequence of this. He may be inclined to take revenge in this world. So Angelo says, he sends off a note to the, uh, to the jail, immediately execute Claudio. In other words, he double crosses the nun that he thinks he has taken advantage of because he has become an utterly Machiavellian politician. So it turns out that if she had had sex with him, her brother would have died anyway. In fact, the path of, rig of religious morality turns out to be the best of all practical paths as well. Not succumbing is the only way to keep herself pot open to salvation and to keep her brother alive. Well, it turns out that not only is there a bed switch, but the friar, who is the duke in disguise, tells the head of the jail, the provost, do not engage in this execution. The execution is a mistake. I want you to switch heads, put the head of Claudio, or leave Claudio's head on his shoulders, put the head of another prisoner who died accidentally due to a fever, put that in the bag, we will bring that into the prince, the, uh, Angelo will never know. Well, they bring it back. And 
We see, then, we have a double switch. Angelo believes that he has committed murder. He believes that he has deflowered this virgin. He believes that he has entirely lost his soul, and he now must answer for it because, unexpectedly, without any anticipation, he and Aeschylus have received writings to the effect that the Duke is going to return. May I suggest to you that these writings that the Duke sends and offers to send throughout the book are, in fact, the Bible? And these writings, which disclose to you that the Duke is going to come back and judge everybody, and he's going to do the job right, because he sees into people's souls and into people's intentions, not like this merely human justice, which is merely concerned with people's actions and does not understand intention, which is fallible. Well, the Duke is coming back, and naturally enough, Angelo and Aeschylus are quite perplexed. Remember that Aeschylus has done no wrong in the course of this play. In fact, he has been a kind and merciful judge because Aeschylus has understood the wisdom of tragedy. Aeschylus understands that people are intrinsically imperfect, and the best you can do is to try and ameliorate their flaws. You will never be able to get rid of them. By trying to make himself perfect and by trying to make Vienna perfect, Angelo has committed the sin of pride, and his hubris pre prevents him from being sanctified and once he makes that first step down the road to sin, sin after sin after sin follows. In other words, what we see here is the fall of a potentially superior man. In some ways, Angelo has many of the qualities of a tragic hero. The big difference is that Angelo does not meet the end of a tragic hero. He meets the end of a comic hero, because at the end of the play, he is not given death but life. Let us look at what the return of the Duke will be like. Oh, it's marvelous. Isabella believes wrongly, it turns out, that her brother has been killed. She has gotten the news that corrupt Angelo, who thinks he has corrupted her, has in fact killed her brother. And of course, she is heartbroken. She knows that in terms of morality, it is just that her brother be punished, but she had so hoped that he would be given mercy and charity along with justice. There is plenty of room for such things, particularly given the fact that Angelo has propositioned her. And she is in a terrible emotional state when the Duke comes back, and she meets the Duke at the gates to the city. She and Mariana go there as supplicants to the Duke who are, demand justice, who are claiming that Angelo has been unjust. Now think back to the Bible of all the imagery of holy and profane cities of Babylon and Jerusalem. Well, it would seem then that for a large part of the history of Vienna, it has been a sort of corrupt city, a city of man rather than a city of God. It has been a sort of Babylon. But this Babylon will be transformed, this whole world will be moved from the profane to the sacred when the Duke comes back for the second time. It turns out that the Duke and the Friar are the same person, and those of you who have read the book of Revelation will know that this entire concluding scene is a reprise of the book of Revelation. In fact, God will come back and judge all of humanity, and everyone in the play gets judged, and not only are they judged, they are given both justice and mercy. Here's how it works. The Duke comes back to the city, they open the gates, and Angelo and Aeschylus meet him, and they give him back the symbols of authority. And the Duke says, have it published throughout the city that if there are any who believe they have been mistreated, have them come to me directly. Mariana and Isabella come, and of course Mariana has actually had sex with Angelo, but Angelo doesn't know that. He believes he has had sex with Isabella. And Isabella comes in and accuses Angelo of being a hypocrite, a murderer, a judicial murderer, a, a deflower of virgins, a hypocrite, an evil man in every respect. And the Duke, now back in the city, plays it very cool. He, said, he acts as though he were merely a temporal rather than a spiritual ruler. He acts as though he were really man rather than God initially. He says, I can't believe that. Angelo has a wonderful reputation. And reputation is so important in our understanding of human beings and our evaluation of testimony for them or against them. A human judge would have been swayed by Angelo's perfect reputation because he has never been known to sin before. But it turns out that at the end of this play, we're not going to get a human judge who will be swayed by reputation. We are going to get a divine judge, and we are going to get perfect justice combined with mercy. Measure will be met with measure. The Duke leaves and says to Aeschylus and Angelo, I leave you two gentlemen in charge of this business. Find out who it is that has put these evil women on to, uh, to, giving the, to giving out these lies about this fine man, Angelo. And of course, it's heavily ironic. There's layer upon layer of irony, and Angelo is very, very nervous because he's very close to being caught here, and he thinks he's going to get over if he can hunt down the person that put these women up to this. He's going to find the friar. 
at this point in the play, Lucio is back now that the Duke is here. And it turns out that Lucio says to the Duke, I know this friar. And this friar is a very wicked man, not the kind of holy man that we would expect here in Vienna. Now, earlier in the play, when he'd been talking to the friar, he said he knew the duke, and the duke was quite a, a ladies' man and quite a drinker and quite a carouser. The idea is that he is constantly saying in, before the very face of God, A, that he knows God, and B, that what he knows about God is that God is immoral. This is the sin of blasphemy. And he blasphemes right to God's face. And in the process of doing that, he sets up his own condemnation. After the, I mean, we're still within this final scene. The Duke leaves, leaves Aeschylus and Angelo in charge. Who makes an appearance? The friar. It's important for the Duke to leave if the friar is going to come on stage and sit the same person. And now that the friar is here and Lucio is in the process of giving false witness against the good friar who has been trying to have people repent their sins and extending mercy and making sure that people avoid sin, he goes on and on and rails against the friar and at the penultimate moment takes the cowl off the friar and feels very uncomfortable because there under the friar's cowl is the Duke himself. And in fact, it turns out that he realizes that, oh no, I have been blaspheming the duke to the friar. I have bas been blaspheming the friar to the duke. I'm nabbed now. There's no way I'm going to get out from under this. And at this point, of course, not only is he caught, but as soon as the duke is uncowled and he turns out to be the same person as the friar, that means that Angelo knows that he's caught. Mariana comes in and, you know, explains the bed trick. So he finds out that, Angelo finds out that although he has committed sin and a vast variety of sins, he has not committed the sin that he thought he had committed with Isabella. And now the Duke is about to mete out stern justice. And it turns out that he says, you, Angelo, the man that would be perfect, that would usurp my power and hypocritically use your, your alleged morality to engage in worse activities than you are condemning, you deserve death. But before you die, I shall have you marry Mariana so that she will inherit your property and title and that she will not be abused by you the way she had been for this many years. Angelo has a powerful and remarkable change of heart here. Angelo says, I deserve it. The only thing that I crave of you, my lord, is that you should kill me immediately. I finally realize what I am, and I'm forced to confront the fact that I am not the man who, would be, who could be perfect. I thought that I could, and I failed. So all I merit now is death. Give it to me, and that would be fine. At that point, Mariana, a prodigy of kindness and good nature, prays to the duke, please do not condemn my husband. For all his faults, for all his evils, I love him, and I ask that you grant him mercy. And the Duke is not initially swayed. And then she says to Isabella, Isabella, lend me your knees. Kneel and pray. Ask the Duke for mercy and clemency. Now this, remember, is the man that she thinks still has killed her brother. This is the man that tried to suborn her into sex, which she knew would cause the loss of her soul. She now is in the position that she talked about in the second act. She said to Angelo, if I were the judge and you were a supplicant to me, I would extend mercy to you. This is called the golden rule. You will find it in the Gospels. Now we have a turning point. What will she do? She kneels down. She asks forgiveness for Angelo. She says that I thought, at least in part, his severity was due to the fact that he thought that he was doing right. At least there is some intention here which is reclaimable. I know that he meant to do wrong, and I believe that he did wrong to my brother, but nonetheless, I ask you, Duke, to extend him mercy. The Duke says, yes, I shall extend him mercy. In fact, it turns out that once Isabella has been tested. Once we find out that she is in fact truly Christian in her ethical motivations, that she is willing to extend mercy to someone who would not extend mercy to her, that she is willing to say, yes, go easy on someone that double-crossed her and killed her brother, we realize that she is the true uncorrupted Christian. She is in fact a personification of the church. In Christian theology, what is the function of the church but to intercede to God for us woeful sinners? She also represents not just the church, but if Angelo is understood to represent the state, what we have here is an eternal conflict between church and state, where politics attempts to corrupt religion. But fortunately for politics and sinful man at the end of the world, religion and the church will be around to intercede and for, to allow for the salvation of us corrupt, immoral individuals.
Well, once Angelo knows what he is and says, all I deserve is death, my lord, I admit my sins, I'm sorry, and I, I know what I deserve, and he gets prayer to intercede for him, the Duke says, all right, I'm now going to commute some sentences here. You, Angelo, you will be married to this woman, and you will transgress no more. You understand who you are and what you are. That will be enough. Perhaps we, could, we might, he doesn't say this, but Angelo might consider changing his name. It, it doesn't sit very well on him. He also says, and now at the end of this, now that, that, that uh, Isabella has prayed for the man who she thinks has killed her brother, he sa on comes Claudio, her brother, who is still alive. We have had the head switch as well as the bed switch here. In comes her brother, and there's a joyous reunion scene. And because her brother has been engaged in fornication, he has gotten this woman with child. And earlier in the play, the friar went to this woman and said, do you repent your sin? She said, yes. Well, since she's repented, and Claudio has been extended mercy because God's mercy and God's justice are not completely distinguishable. She says, you deserve death because Angelo was right, but I will let you slide because this is the end of the world, and I am simultaneously extending both justice and mercy. Those two get married. Angelo and Mariana get married. And he says to Isabella, Isabella, will you consider giving up your vows as a nun? Will you marry me? At the end of the play, the Duke is about to be married to Isabella. May I suggest that this is the end of the book of Revelation. This is God marrying his church, which is described in the book of Revelation as the bride of Christ. These images and metaphors do not slide into this play accidentally. This is one of the most remarkable achievements of the human mind. This allegory is so detailed and so remarkable that it doesn't even leave out the devil. Did you think that he was going to get away once the Duke comes back? Oh, no, no. He uncowls the Duke, and the Duke starts dealing out both mercy and justice, and we have this mass marriage scene. Remember what I said in the beginning of the lecture, that comedy characteristically ends in marriage? Well, may I suggest that what marriage does, it, it's the inverse of the death that we get at the end of the tragic hero. Tragedy individuates. Othello becomes Othello, Hamlet becomes Hamlet because he is who he is. At the end of comedy, we inevitably have marriages because marriage doesn't individuate it does the opposite. It reintegrates people back into society. Uh, do you know the way fairy tales end and they lived happily ever after? Comedy has built within it a longing for eternal life. Comedy is the opposite dramatic tendency from the drive towards death that we see in tragedy. And what could be more perfect for a Christian interpretation of history that, that everybody should be judged properly and understood to be a sinner and yet reintegrated into society on the basis of God's mercy which overlaps with God's justice. This is an absolutely amazing theological tour de force. Now, take it a little further. The devil does not get away. He does not get over here. The devil, while all these marriages and judgments and, merc and merciful activities are going on, tries to slink off stage. And it's very important that the director of this play know, have someone that slinks very well and moves into the shadows, because shadow and light will be very important when you're producing a play like this. He tries to slink over to the shadows, and there's a wonderful saying, because the Duke knows everything. Remember, he's, he's Yahweh, he's omniscient. So it's not like the devil's going to sneak off stage. He says, you, sir, I mean to talk to you. I wish to have a word with you. And now he can't help but come and meet his maker, literally speaking, deal with the Duke. And he says, do you know the Duke for a, a drunkard? Do you know the, dru the Duke for a, a woman chaser? Do you know the Duke for a carouser and an evil man? I heard you say something along those lines. Did I not? And he says, well, <laughs> yeah, but I, I really didn't mean it. He's trying to, trying to get out from under this. And he says, you deserve a whipping, and then you deserve a hanging. And I think that that would be just a fine thing for you. And in addition to that, I think you should get married, too, because in the course of the play, it turns out that not only has he been frequenting a brothel, but he, the brothel he's been frequenting, he has gotten one of the... Uh, the, the whores in this brothel with an illegitimate child. So he says, before I hang you, I'm going to whip you. And before I do any of that, I'm going to have you married off so that all your property goes to this whore and to her child. May I suggest that what we have here is Lucio the devil being married off to the whore of Babylon? That's what the symbolism is. Yes, indeed, the whore of Babylon is going to be married off to Lucio, and he is forgiven even he gets a certain degree of mercy. He is forgiven the whipping. He is forgiven the hanging. All he has to do is make an honest woman of her and make her child legitimate. I would venture the guess that her child is named Sin. And this is perhaps the greatest achievement of comic art. Now, there are many more 
symbolic elements that I could pull out of this. When I taught this a few weeks ago at Princeton with my students, we pulled out at least a hundred direct references to the New Testament. This is saturated in Christian mythology and symbolism. If you don't see the Christian iconography, this play makes no sense at all. In other words, if you try and, re and read it as a realistic representation of human sexual desire, it's laughably bad. It's got to be Shakespeare's worst play. If you don't read it that way, and if you bring in the Christian iconography, this is Shakespeare's greatest comedy, and it is arguably the greatest comedy ever written. And I'll close this treatment of Shakespeare because I unfortunately am running out of time, but I'll close it with a passage from Mark, which gives us the biblical resonance and explains how this final scene works out. Mark chapter 4 verse 24 says, With what measure you mete out, it shall be measured out to you. And unto you that hear, still more shall be given. The still more that shall be given is God's mercy that comes at the end of the play after God's judgment. And so what we have here in Measure for Measure is a Trinitarian Christian play. God the Father, Yahweh, leaves, begins the world, but then comes back to judge. God comes back seemingly as a holy man who tells people to repent their sins in the form of the friar. That's Jesus. And at the end of the play, when God's justice and God's mercy turn out to be the same thing, that's the return of the Spirit, because the Spirit of the law is that mercy and justice are not distinguishable.